Released on this day 30 years ago, Streets of Rage 3, or better yet, Bare Knuckle 3 is, to say the least, a divisive game. Well, at least according to the answers given on my Twitter post with some fans praising it for its boldness while others criticize it for deviating too much from the legendary Bare Knuckle 2. But despite that, it's undeniable that this game is another gem from Sega that, no matter which side of the discussion you are on, left its mark in history. So let's take a look and see what Bare Knuckle 3 is all about. But before all that, hi, I am Savino and welcome to the Flying Kick channel. It's hard to come by certain types of information about such old games, but I don't think that back then anyone was surprised to learn that one of Sega's most successful game was getting a sequel. I really don't remember reading about the game until it was released in Japan, some good 4 months before we got it here in the West, but I was a Nintendo kid back then, so yeah, my lack of awareness of anything Sega at the time won't surprise anyone. Surfing on the success of its predecessor and with all rights in the world to do so, Sega kind of rushed the game's production, probably moving money and personnel to finish it in time. Unfortunately, I don't have anything to back this claim, as I said, it's pretty hard to find this type of information from old games, but it's possible to infer it if you take into consideration the game's size and that it took 3 months less to be completed when compared to the second one. However, I suspect that complete may be a strong word and that Bare Knuckle 3 could have been a way bigger game. You see, in 1994, the next generation of consoles was present in every conversation. Actually, it was a bit more crazy than that. Not only you had the next generation looming on the horizon, but you also had a ton of other consoles and accessories trying to get a bite from the market pie. Those were some crazy times with companies all around the globe releasing new systems promising they were the real deal. 3DO, Philips CDI and Atari Jaguar, consoles were being released every single year and all of them were promising the true next-gen experience. 3D graphics. Wow! Even Sega was competing with itself with two expensive add-ons for the Mega Drive and with the earlier release of the Saturn later that year. With all this happening at the same time, it's not a stretch to think that, at some point, Sega rushed the production of the game. Incomplete extra characters and some cut content are also indications that Bare Knuckle could have been, as I said, way bigger than it currently is. Despite that, the game was released to much praise from the reviews at the time. Well, at least here in the West. It is already hard enough to find old Western magazines, imagine finding them in a language that you have no idea how to read. Curiously enough, in my search, I was able to find a few European magazines that covered the Japanese version of the game and, as you may imagine, the game was praised, but the consensus was that it was inferior to the previous one, but was it really inferior to Bare Knuckle 2? Well, when it comes to the story, Bare Knuckle 3 is undoubtedly superior to the second one. Gone are the gangs terrorizing cities with vandalism and kidnapping, the stakes here are way higher than that. The game starts with an experimental weapon called the Hakushin detonating in Oak City, killing 30,000 people and injuring another 80,000 in the process. Actually, this is the first sentence you read in the game. Sega was always aiming their games to a more mature audience, but in this case they really wanted to shock people. The story also has a touch of geopolitics mixing in the story, the Lima region, a fictional region inhabited by many nations that want nothing more than an excuse to start a war. To solve this issue, General Petrov is called to the US to start some peace talks, but he never reached his destination. Meanwhile, Axon and Blaze are contacted by the self-proclaimed Rakushin inventor Dr. Zen, who says that his research has been used for destructive purposes and asks for the help of the duo. The story will be unfolded as you play with lots of cutscenes and talks between the characters, and I can say this is a pretty interesting story for a game like this. It has some interesting twists that can lead you to multiple endings, which is always a positive point. Compared to the previous game, Bare Knuckle 3 is way more mature and offers players an introduction to subjects that the grown-ups were talking about every night at dinner table. Geopolitics, terrorist strikes, political kidnapping, industrial espionage, I mean, these are not the subjects you would find in many games at the time, especially on a Nintendo console. 
This is without a doubt the best plot in 16 bit beaten up had. Ok, now let's talk about a point I think may be a little controversial the graphics. Coming in a cartridge with 24 megas, it was more than expected that everything in the game would be bigger bigger levels, bigger sprites, shinier bells and whistles, and while some of these expectations were met, some, at least in my view, weren't. When running the game for the first time, you may not be as impressed as you were with the neon filled streets from the second game. The warehouse you start at may not catch your attention at first, but if you look closely, you will see how detailed and alive the backgrounds are. You can see chains attached to the ceiling swinging as you throw your enemies on the ground, small red lights blinking on metal beams, and a very nice parallax scrolling. Yes, parallax scrolling was nothing new in 1994, but usually, in indoor scenes like that, you would expect to see a single wall of crates covering everything from the floor up to the ceiling. Here, you have a lot of death with more distant boxes being a little more darker. There is also some box in the foreground to add even more to the sense of death. It's an amazing level that took me a while to appreciate. And things only get better from here. Before fighting Nash, you can spot the sky changing colors indicating the sunset is approaching, and a little later when fighting Shiva, you can see a glorious sun in the background while flying kick the heck out of him. It's simply gorgeous. The whole game is a sight to behold, there's no shortage of great scenarios like the seizure inducing second level with lots of lights blinking all around, or the construction site where, after reaching the last floor, you can spot Oak City's lights shimmering the night sky. Well, they are not actually shimmering, but it looks beautiful nonetheless. Even places that are somewhat boring, like the beginning of the 5th and 6th levels, can surprise you with some beautiful vistas in the middle or ending of the stage. It's a game where every place you visit will pay off with some of the best pixel art the Mega Drive has seen up to that date. When it comes to the characters, yeah... Honestly, I find them pretty ugly. I'm not sure if what bothers me here is the greedy look they have now or it is because they remind me of pre-rendered characters since they clearly have more depth when compared to the other games from the series, but the bottom line is I really don't like them. I think the more vibrant look of Bare Knuckle 2 is more pleasant for my taste, but I have to agree that somehow they blend perfectly with the backgrounds. The animation is also improved here in some ways, while most of your moves have the same number of frames as the previous version, your characters got a lot of new moves with new and awesome animations. Sega always knew how to make excellent animations and this was no exception, just compare Blaze sprite sheets and <laughs> you'll see what I mean. Oh yeah, and there's this black cat that comes out of the garbage bin every time you throw someone on the floor and it looks adorable. Now let's talk about a very controversial subject, the OST and sound effects. Starting with the sound effects, I will not lie to you, they are awful. I know I will probably start a war in the comments, but the SNES always had a way better sound than the Mega Drive. Anyone who played Street Fighter on both machines will know what I'm talking about. The screens and grunts from your enemies and characters are terrible here sounding more like chalk scratching on a board than a human being screaming. For my years, the second game has a much better sound sample for the voices, and the same can be said about the hit effects. Come on, compare this to this. What am I doing here? Lightly slapping someone? Where's the crunchiness? Where's the feeling of power? Honestly, I would love to see a version of this game with the sound effects from the second one. It would make the game 10 times better. And there's the OST. Created by the legendaries Yuzu Koshiro and Motohiro Kawashima, the same duo who work on the second game, the OST is... well... take a listen. <laughs> My first 
impression of this OST was of complete awe. And not in a positive way. I was, what, 16 years old when I first played this game and my teenage years weren't ready for this. All I could hear for the longest time was incomprehensible electronic noises and in some sense I was right. It's not a revelation that Koshiro created an automated composed system to help him create the songs for this game. Most samples here were randomly generated by the system and they can be very aggressive to untrained ears. But if you really pay attention to it, like outside the game, you will start to notice some order inside the scales. Yes, a lot of samples were randomly generated, but that's not the same as randomly selected. Both Koshiro and Kawashima were there manually selecting the samples and changing what they saw fit. The final product is clearly something way ahead of this time. I'm not sure how many of you enjoy classical music, but listening to the soundtrack reminded me a lot of the first time I listened to Stravinsky. Despite the huge difference between both styles, you can note similarities like the rhythm is constantly changing, the presence of dissonance harmonies everywhere, and lots of metric imbalances. His work in this game was so ahead of his time that years later the UK magazine Fact said that this soundtrack was a foreshadowing of what later would be known as trance music. His work on this game, according to the publication in 2018, is historical, challenging, innovative, and artistic. I'm not saying I like it, I'm not saying it's fitting to the game, and for heaven's sake, I'm not saying this is better than Bare Knuckle 2 OST, but saying the OST is bad isn't fair. Sure, not all songs here are good, some can be very unpleasant to say the least, but there is a lot of cool stuff here, you just need to know what you are listening to. Now, when it comes to combat, I don't think there's much to talk or complain about here. I mean, there are a ton of places out there talking about the characters, their moves, their specials, and this video is getting pretty big without me telling things that you will be better off looking on a written guide, but yeah. To add my two cents to the whole conversation, I would say that the combat here is way better than the second one. Actually, not better. I think one could say this was an evolution of what SEGA created almost two years prior. Your attacks here feel faster than before and your options when facing new threats were never so plentiful. Especially if you own a six-boot controller which will make the combat even more dynamic. Bare Knuckle 3, and as a huge Double Dragon and Final Fight fan, this hurts me to say, has the best combat in the whole 16-bit generation, and I'm counting a lot of arcade games in this statement. Compared to the second one, you can now run with all characters and unleash some cool moves while doing it. Your Blitz move now has its own bar and will not drain your health as long as the bar is full. Eden, unfortunately, is not present, or Max, but he skates back again more agile and faster than before. The newcomer, Zen, while it's not a very good substitute for Max, will not disappoint as a character, being the one with the longest reach, very fast, and with an energy bowling ball that's very fun to use. Zen is a bit of an easy mode for the game, in my opinion. Action and Blaze do not play much differently from what we were used to in the past. The addition of the many special moves made better what was already great, and the ability to run with them brought a breath of fresh air and speed to the game, which we must agree here is a tad bit long. The game also now counts with a star system that will make your moves a little more powerful with each star you earn. You can get them with each 4000 points, reaching the maximum of 3 stars, and you will lose one if you die. It's a pretty interesting system that really keeps you on your toes since you don't want to lose a star and get weaker in later levels. And you will have plenty of opportunities to use every move in your arsenal. The game will not pull any punches and on the first screen you will be bombarded with enemies. This is the third game of the series and Sega made this game for its fans, the hardcore crowd that already knew how to deal with games like this. To prove they weren't kid, they simply threw one of the most badass characters ever created as the first boss, Shiva. Mr. X's bodyguard, the second hardest enemy in the previous game, is now simply the lowest of the bosses. In all honesty, I think this is the game that most approached the arcade quality when it comes to the combat. Yeah, Bare Knuckle 2 was praised for its arcade quality when it was released, but in my opinion, the third game is where the combat peaked. 
And sure, here you face some old and new foes, Electra, Garcia, Donovan, Signal, the whole crew are here and they brought new friends. The AI feel more dangerous with enemies moving quickly around you and not missing any opportunity when you lower your guard. But despite that, the game does not feel unfair, you can easily beat it on normal or hard with the lives and continues you have available on your first try, but that also doesn't mean the game is easy, you need to learn how your enemies behave, learn how to place yourself in the scenario and most importantly, use your brand new dodge roll to avoid hits and projectiles. There's two things that I find interesting in this game. The first is how you can't hit like in most games off-screen enemies. If they are outside the boundaries of the arena, even if you can see part of their body, you won't be able to hit them. To keep things fair, they won't hit you either. So the best thing here is to stay in the middle of the screen so you don't lose too much time. The other thing, and I find this pretty curious, is that Electra and her minions will take longer to get up if you stay in their surroundings. I'm not sure why this happens, because as far as I can say, she's the only one who does that, but it's an interesting detail that I never saw mentioned. While most things here are nothing but stellar, some shortcomings hold the game back a little bit. First of all, I would like to talk about the bosses. In Bare Knuckle 2, most bosses were amazing to fight against. They were hard and smart, but more often than not, they felt fair. In the third game, well, the bosses are a bit lame. The two sisters from the second level who never stop jumping around, Yamato and his two clones on the fourth level, and the less we talk about Jet, the better. And there's also this mechanical clone here that is... Uh, I mean, really? Even the fight with Neo X isn't as memorable as your battle with Mr. X in the second game. Some levels feel a bit longer than they could be and really, what's up with the army of clones in some places here? I know it's not lack of power to render different sprites, so I really don't know what's the point. While in general this is not that bad, some enemies can be pretty annoying when a lot of them are jumping around you. Is Bare Knuckle 3 better than the second one? Well, no. While I think the combat is better here, the bosses aren't as memorable, the impact sounds are pathetic and the soundtrack, despite all the deserved compliments for its boldness, does not fit the game in the slightest. It actually subtracts a little from the experience since the sounds of your moves will mix with the soundtrack and the result, well, there's a reason why most people say that the soundtrack outside the game is a whole new experience. No, no, I still think that, for all it is, Bare Knuckle 2 still holds the place as the best in the series. The third one was butchered here in the West, making it look bad in our eyes thanks to Sega and their marvelous decisions at the time. I mean, I don't wanna bash Sega, but I don't think that even the most hardcore fan would deny that around 1994, Sega was completely lost and a ton of bad decisions were made. Bare Knuckle 3 may not be the game a lot of us expected it to be, but it sure is a hell of a game, one that deserves a place among the best of its time. If you never tried the Japanese release or if you did and didn't like it, I will ask you to give it a go. It may not impress you at first, but after a while, I can assure you, something inside you will click and you will start to see this game as the gen it truly is. And that's it for the video guys, I hope you guys enjoy my views on this classic game and please share in the comments your thoughts about it, do you agree with me, disagree, what's your favorite game from the series? Other than that, I hope you all have an awesome day and remember, keep beating up.